Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the Understanding Headaches and Hydrocephalus More Than a High Pressure Headache webinar. Your hosts for this session are Hydrocephalus Canada and the Association de Spina Bifida et de Hydrocephalus du Quebec. The event is generously sponsored by Heritage Canada. I'm Shauna Bodway, the Director of Programs and Information at Hydrocephalus Canada, and I will be this afternoon's moderator. Today's session will include tips on what information your doctor needs to evaluate and treat your headaches, help you recognize the headache red flags, learning when you need to worry, and when you need to see your doctor. Finally, Dr. Lagman will review the types and treatments of different headaches disorders in children and adults with hydrocephalus and what you can do to improve your headaches. Please note that the speaker is not recommending any specific course of treatment or medications. Always speak with your healthcare providers about any course of treatment to ensure it is right for you or your child. Okay, so we are very pleased to welcome Dr. Marissa Lagman who is an assistant professor in pediatrics neurology at the University of Toronto. She is the director of the headache program at the Hospital for Sick Children and the Pediatric and Young Adult Headache and Con sorry, Concussion Program at the Center for Headache Women's College Hospital. She is also the education lead of the Center for Headache Women's College Hospital and co-lead of the Transition Committee, Division of Neurology, the Hospital for Sick Children. A very warm welcome to Dr. Legman. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Shauna, and all the organizers of this webinar for actually inviting me. So um, we'll try as much as we can to learn from each other. Um, as, as Shauna has mentioned, there's some limits to what I can. I can uh, teach you today, but I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have at the end of the, this um, session. Okay, so these are my disclosures, non relevant to this presentation, and all those fees go anyway to the Women's College Hospital and Hospital for Sick Children. So as Sean has mentioned, I will try at my best to, uh, throughout this talk, that you will, towards the end of this talk, you'll be able to develop your own approach in evaluating your headaches and give you some tips on what, your informa uh, what information your doctor needs, recognize what these red flags are, when do you need to worry, and I'll explain the different types of headaches in children and adults with hydrocephalus and what you can do to improve your headaches. So why is it even relevant for us to actually discuss um, headache? Headache in general globally is the second most prevalent health condition. Specifically migraine is the second most disabling condition of all the health conditions. In the lifetime of a patient with hydrocephalus, both in children and adults, they have, are exposed to different risk factors which puts them at risk of developing any type of headache. So for example, if you started having, um, you have a hydrocephalus, if your child has hydrocephalus over the lifetime of that child, they can potentially have like uh, spikes of headaches all throughout their lifetime due to multiple reasons. And we'll go into those details later. And then they may have like few spikes and then later on will have continuous headache. And then there's some uh, patients who are in, they have primary headache disorders like migraine or tension type headache or different types of headache as well that they will develop over a lifetime. And that's where the um, challenge is. If, if there's something that you need to worry or is this, this my migraine headache or my tension type headache? Same thing with adults, right? So if the onset of their headache, uh, hydrocephalus is at onset, then they will also have some headaches because related to their shunt or through other, other risk factors, or they may develop like a headache and then never goes away, or they can potentially have primary headache disorders as well. So I thought I will start with one of my patients. This is not the true, uh, real name of my patient, just to uh, protect confidentiality and privacy. So um, I just recently saw this patient, I think a week ago. 
So she's seven year old and she was diagnosed with hydrocephalus, um, had VP shunting um, and then referred to my clinic due to severe headaches. So the mother is coming with so many questions for me. So she was asking when she should worry about the, her, her, his, her child's headache and if this is headache is due to his shunt or other causes, and when does she need to bring him to the emergency room department for management? I think those are the most challenging part to actually ask. So, and, and what I did is I took a headache history. So apparently she ha he had congenital heart disease and had multiple surgeries for correction or repair of the heart defect. Uh, but over time, um, he, he was noted to have progressive enlargement of his head. And that's when they did the cranial MRI and it was noted to have obstructive hydrocephalus. I think it's a complication from one of his cardiac surgeries. And then he had VB shunting um, as early as seven months of age, and then had total four, four total revisions, an infection at one year old, an obstruction and oral malfunction once at two years old and twice in 2021. Okay, so when we actually, a patient comes to our clinic and if you uh, have a child or you yourself has hydrocephalus and develop a headache, when a doctor to, uh, talks to you, our primary goal is to get a detailed history from you. Okay, and then the reason why we're doing that is we want to know what those if you your history has some red flags in it. So if you don't present any red headache, headache red flags, then we are certain that you might potentially have the uh, primary headache disorder. Or if you have some atypical features that you're giving us in the history, um, or there's some uh, red flags in the story that you're giving us, then we have to definitely evaluate the secondary for he secondary headache. Because they, you have in, um, you're presenting with a headache in a context of hydrocephalus, right? So we almost have the, the safest approach is to meet, check first if there's some worrisome features of your headache to explain um, why you're having the headache before we can discuss more or uh, come up with the idea that you have another type of headache, which is the primary headache disorder. Okay. So what information do we need from you? So for older adolescents and for those patients who can tell their history and for adults, we ask for what do you actually um, um, experience before the onset of your headache? Do you have visual changes or numbness or tingling or any speech problems prior to the onset of your headache? And then we ask you detailed description of what your headache is. So is it a sudden onset? Where is it located? Is it one side or both sides? What, the, what kind of headache is it? Is it a pounding headache? Is it a sharp headache? And then how bad is it? Does it stop you from being functional? And how frequent are these headaches are and how long do they last for? And what makes them worse and what makes them better? And then the other things that we need to do is also check for other symptoms like, do you feel nauseous? Do you vomit? Or do you have light and sound sensitivity? Are this affecting your school or your work day? Are you missing school? Are you miss, miss, missing work? Are there patterns to your headache? Or do they only happen during your menses? Or they only happen during weekends? And triggers, what triggers your headaches are very important. And what medications you're taking even over the counter to, to check if you have rebound headaches, which I'm going to explain in a little bit. The challenging part is that for younger patients, I think there is a question about a toddler. How would you actually ask, uh, look for signs of headache or uh, in, in a young child? So for less than year, six years old uh, first, um, then we ask them to draw a picture of their themselves and how they feel during a headache. And then for very, very young patients that we relied a lot on their parents to, uh, more of like report to us, what are the signs and symptoms that could be inferred in your behavior? So I asked my patient or the, the parents of my patients and asked them, are they irritable? Are they holding their head or they're heating their head? Are they covering their eyes or ears, which infers that they have light and sound sensitivity? Do they stop playing? A child will not stop playing. 
But if they're feeling something or if they're feeling a headache, they're holding their head and they have to stop playing, then that's a significant headache enough. They could, we could actually rate that pain to be a moderate or severe headache. We also look for clues in the story you know, that you're giving us. So is there anyone in the family with migraine or any other headaches? And these are important as well to give us clues that it could be potentially migraine, like is your baby colicky? Do they have motion sickness? Are, um, is there sleepwalking or sleep talking, abdominal migraine as well, or head tilting? We call, we call that torticolis and vertigo or spinning sensation and cyclic vomiting. So when do you worry and when do you see your doctor? So these are the headache red flags. You have to snoop for them. Uh, the mnemonic is snoop S is for systemic symptoms. For example, fever, right? Uh, neck stiffness, or um, that will tell you that in a patient with hydrocephalus shunt infection, meningitis, it could be a, a form of meningitis. That's why they have stick neck stiffness encephalitis or infection of the CSF or cerebrospinal fluid, which would be called ventricul uh, ventriculitis. Progressive head enlargement, progressive or intractable vomiting that could actually mean that it's a high pressure headache. So it could be a malfunction of the shunt or an obstruction of the shunt. N is for neurological signs and symptoms. So eye exam is very important for us. So that's the reason why in patients like that, we ask them to visit our clinic because we look at the back of the eyes if there's some disc swelling or what we call disc edema, any presence of seizure in any patient, even if they don't have a hydrocephalus, is a red flag for us because there's so many things that actually can present with seizure. Uh, high pressure can also present with seizure, a bleed in the brain, so the, all patients are not excused, especially for the older one, they are not excused to having a stroke, which could be a bleed or low flow blood flow in the brain. So it, they can present, um, uh, patients who had stroke or bleeding can also present with seizures. Any weakness or numbness, and steady walk, gait, or being clumsy, like decreased level of consciousness, they're quite sleepy, very dull, and their poor organization skills are worsening memory, especially for adults. Some visual changes, uh, if it's transient visual loss or doubling of their vision, a vertigo, as I mentioned, the uh, spinning sensation. So these are the things that we look for and ask from you uh, to check, is this a high pressure headache, right? Is it a low pressure headache? What could be a shunt malfunction or vascular causes like a bleed or a stroke? Sudden onset, a very like more of like a thunderclap headache. That is a red flag for us because that could mean more of like a very worrisome headache, which is more, in, uh, more of vascular cause like bleeding or stroke. Well, high pressure headache can also um, present with thunderclap headache, but not as often as a patient who had a bleed in the brain. Um, early morning headache or awakening in the middle of the night is a sign of high pressure headache. If there is a headache that only started more than 50 years of age, we are worried about those patients because we have to look for other symptoms like um, giant arthritis, for example, it's an inflammatory disease or any headache at less than five years of age, we almost always have to rule out worrisome causes for the headaches. If it's a progressive headache, right? It's a different headache, even if you had the previous headache before, and then now you're presenting with a new one, then that's something that we have to dig in further and snoop for red flags, right? Um, and if it's precipitated by Valsalva, coughing or sneezing, that will give you a cue. That's a high pressure headache. If it, is it positional? So headache that's the worst sense when lying down, is in keeping with high pressure headache. When a headache is triggered by sitting up or standing up, that's more in keeping with a low pressure headache. Of course, if uh, in adults they, or in older adolescents, they can get pregnant, any headache in a pregnant patient, even if you don't have hydrocephalus, that's a red flag for us. So we snoop for more red flags for those patients. So in, if you have recurrent headaches and we ex your doctor examine you and there's normal neurologic examination, unless there are other signs, then we don't do any CT scans or MRIs. But if there are red flags that 
those things that I mentioned. And there is some abnormal neurological findings when we examine you. And there's some recent onset of severe headaches, change in the type of headaches that you're having or fever or any other systemic symptoms. Then that's the time that we worry. And then we might do an MRI or a CT scan based on what we're thinking, your, the secondary cause for your headache. So there are definitely, as I mentioned, because of the history of hydrocephalus, the safest approach for us doctors who are managing you are, is to rule out worrisome causes for the headaches before we can say it's a primary headache disorder like migraine or tension type headache. The first thing that comes to mind is, is it a high pressure headache because of the history of hydrocephalus? Is, it, is, is your shunt malfunctioning or is it failing? Is there any obstruction in that or is there any sign of infection? So, and if it is that, then we actually make sure that the neurosurgeon who are, is managing your shunt is aware. So at SickKids, for example, we actually involve, uh, when you come to us, we almost always call our neurosurgery and surgery colleagues just to give, um, see you as well. And sometimes it's hard to actually know if it's high pressure. So they need to do ICP monitoring, for example. And we do that a lot at sick kids. And even at, uh, in adults as well, they, they also do that in Toronto Western Hospital wherein they have to do ICP monitoring to find out if it's a high pressure headache. And if the shunt is the one which is malfunctioning, then we, they, um, they actually do surgical intervention. They have either they change the shunt or they revise the shunt. Okay, so what are the potential signs and symptoms of a shunt failure in a, young, in a very young child, in newborn up to three years of age? So bulging fontanelle, especially if their soft spot is still open, right? Enlarging head and circumference. So that's also the reason why your pediatrician or your healthcare provider is actually measuring um, their head circumference every time that you see them. Um, and we plot it in a, in a curve, so to make sure that it's in the right trajectory. And if it's enlarging too fast, then we worry about that. If signs of like irritability or they're like sleepy or lethargic. And in younger patients, as I mentioned, for a three year in a newborn, that's more headaches will present with nonstop crying, right? Um, and in a patient with the three year old, they might hold their head and they're, sometimes they hit their head. Um, intractable or progressive vomiting or nausea, that's something that we, we worry about, that it could be a high pressure headache because of a shunt failure. Squinting or misalignment of the eyes, or do, uh, which would actually present with double vision. That's something uh, that we actually um, would, a three-year-old report, but if you observe it, if there's a misalignment of, of the eyes, that's something that you can ask your doctors to check if it's more from a, um, a high pressure headache. Swelling along the shunt track. So I asked my, the parents of my patient to always check the track of the shunt to make sure if there's no swelling or um, if there's no CSF leak around the area. In older patients, in three years up to adults, sometimes you may see personality changes. Um, again, lethargy, loss of coordination and balance, new onset seizures. Uh, it's progressive headache again, um, deterioration in school or job performance, uh, diminish or double vision, neck or back pain. I know this is a very soft sign, but I think if it's a new onset and it's also associated with other symptoms which are listed here, then I think you should worry about that. Intractable nausea or vomiting and changes in the bowel and bladder, meaning you have incontinence. Um, and these are the things that you can, you almost always have, I ask my patients to actually look for clues. Like a shunt infection will look like this. There's some redness around the area. You can see some CSF leak as well um, in, in some patients. Then definitely uh, we need to involve your neurosurgeons for, for this, if you find this um, in, your, in the skin of a patient. Slit ventricle syndrome is another important uh, or a more common cause of headache in a patient with hydrocephalus with a shunt. And this is a trial of having a headache, a slow refilling of the valve and narrow ventricles in the imaging as shown here. The mechanism behind this is more of over drainage of the cerebrospinal fluid. And there is some 
five distinct syndromes to explain why you have slit ventricle syndrome. Sorry, it should be slit ventricle syndrome. So it could be an intermittent, extremely low pressure headache. Another reason could be an intermittent, an intermittent proximal obstruction. That's why they sometimes in imaging, you don't see it. It could be a shunt failure with small ventricles. So it's called normal volume hydrocephalus. Or it could be the most common ones is the high pressure with working shunt or what we call the hydrocephalic pseudo tumor. Or it might be a headache not related at all with the shunt. Okay. I know this is a busy slide, but I hope this is one of the impo more important slides that I was thinking that, to share with you. Um, so to differentiate between a high pressure headache and a low pressure headache and a headache which you should not worry about but needed to be treated like migraine, tension headache, or cluster. So location of the pain. So um, in high pressure headache is often in the front or behind the eyes, but it also varies, right? In low pressure headache, it's usually at the back of the head. But again, it could also present anywhere. Uh, migraine is only one-sided, but in younger patients, it could be both sides, right? Tension type headache is always both, both sides. And in cluster headache, definitely it's side lock on one side, okay? Worse in the morning, or it could fluctuate. The timing of the headache is also important. It could be worse in the morning, as I mentioned a while ago, it could be high pressure headache. Um, same thing as a uh, um, worse as the day progresses. That's more in keeping with the low pressure headache. Um, the patterns vary in uh, other primary headache disorder because migraine patient can also wake up with a severe headache. Awakening at night can be present both in high pressure and low CSF pressure headache and is very frequent in cluster headache, uh, which I'm going to um, uh, discuss a bit later. And worse with exercise, well, salva, straining, bending over, all of those are present both in high pressure and low pressure headache. It could be present in migraine as well, but not to um, in carry malformation, which is a secondary cause of headache as well. Effect of caffeine, none, none actually in high pressure headache or it could potentially worsen it. In low pressure headache, it, caffeine actually improves low pressure headaches. But if um, unfortunately overusing caffeine can trigger migraine. The positional, I think I mentioned that if it's worse, if the headache is worse lying flat, that's more high pressure. If it's better lying flat, then it's, like, uh, it's low pressure headache. Migraine patients tend to lie down because it makes them better. Patients with cluster, they pace around. They can't lie down because it makes the headaches worse. The effect of lying with the head down. So none, um, that doesn't have any effect on high pressure. Sometimes it could worsen their headaches. But that strategy of uh, the head down when lying down actually improves low pressure headache because it brings more CSF or cerebrospinal fluid and blood flow to the brain. Ringing the ears is very common in patients with high pressure headache, very rare and low pressure headache, not associated with migraine, but sometimes uh, because of their sensitivity to sound, patients with migraine will have ringing in their ears. Transient visual loss is very common in high pressure headache. Okay, so this is the story that the uh, Josh's mom actually uh, gave me. So the headache started January of 2019. They were infrequent, one to two times in a month. Uh, light and sounds bother him and nausea and vomiting occasionally happens and their headaches last for three to four hours. Triggers are more of spring to summer. So it's more weather changes. Um, June to July of 2022, she had, he had more frequent. They were happening one to two times a week for, and they're longer as well, five to eight hours with severe nausea and vomiting, feeling unwell, and she was, he was missing school. And this is where the, Josh's mom actually got confused because of the severe nausea and vomiting with Josh's headaches. Right, so he was not sure, is this a headache because of his shunt or is it a headache because of 
uh, a lot of things. So he was admitted during this time and they did an IC, ICP monitoring and the shunt was working well. And that's why the patient was sent to me to more of like help Joseph's mom to actually find out what type of headaches does Josh pass and um, treat them appropriately. She had, he, because he had one severe attack, which woke him up in the middle of the night due to a sudden severe onset of um, this headache. So I diagnosed him with migraine. So what is migraine? A headache is called a migraine in, um, in older patients. They last anywhere from four to 72 hours. In younger, they're shorter, two to 72 hours. You should have at least two of these headache characteristics. As I mentioned in older, it could be one side, it could be right or left. In, uh, in younger children, often they could be on both sides, but when they turn into older adolescents and older teens and early 20s, then they become on one side only. The pounding quality is very important. However, however though in young children, it's up to 60% could be non-pounding. They get worse moving around or any physical activity may worsen the headache. That's why they prefer to lie down. They're moderate to severe intensity. Anyone here, the patient might have light and sound sensitivity or nausea or vomiting. You don't have to have all of them, but Josh actually had all of them. In younger patients with migraine, there's a lot of nausea and vomiting. Usually that improves when they're turned into teens and they have more of the light and sound sensitivity. So how do you find out? Um, so patients will actually, uh, I ask parents or, or you yourself, well, at the worst peak of your headache, do you prefer to be in the dark and quiet room or do you prefer to lie down? So that is inferred in the behavior that you have light and sound sensitivity. You should have at least five attacks and Joss did, had more, right? Since January of 2019. And uh, for, for me to be able to diagnose Josh that he has migraine, the, her neurosurgeon, his neurosurgeon and, uh, and um, uh, had to actually rule out from IC monitoring and some imaging that his, his shunt is working and the ICP is actually within normal. Okay, so two in this box and one in this associated feature is equal to migraine. There are several things that you can also check. This is a fast screener for migraine. It's called ID migraine. So does the light bother you when you have a headache? Has a headache limited your activities for a day uh, in the last three months? Are you feel sick to your stomach when you have the headache? So if you answer two, yes to two out of the three, that means there is a 93% that you have migraine. But if you answer yes to the three questions, then there's 98 probability that you, you have migraine. In younger children, is, we have a screener as well. So if you ask your child if they're le uh, less than 12, if, uh, if they rate their pain as bad or very bad, do they feel like the head is pounding or uh, like hammer, hammering, right? Or do you have any, uh, do they get worse when you run, walk or play? And then if they had similar headaches in the past, that would, uh, that if you answer yes to those questions, it has a very high sensitivity that the, your child has migraine. Between 12 to 18, they're basically the same. Are they moderate to severe? Or is it a pounding headache? Or do they skip school or sports event because of the headache? If they answer to yes to those questions, then they're likely to have migraine as well. How common is migraine? Why are we um, more of like discussing this? So as I mentioned, it's the second most disabling health condition globally. There's 1 billion worldwide with migraine, one in four household, one in five women, one in 16 men, and one in 11 children. In Canada, 25% of women were diagnosed with migraine, 8% in men, and 10% in children. As you can notice here, it's far more common in females. There are some other headache disorders available in the Migraine Canada website, like chronic tension type headache, the cluster headache. What's cluster headache? That's a headache that's only on one side. They actually uh, tell you that there's some redness on that eye. There's some droopiness on that eye. They could have um, droopiness and then more of nasal, um, nasal congestion, or they could have uh, tearing on that eye. So those are what we call the autonomic features. And those are the patients with cluster headache. 
trigeminal neuralgia is a pain on this section of your uh, on the on the nose and the mouth area, wherein it's a stabbing pain, very fast, quick, a uh, few seconds, and it goes away. New daily persistent headache is a headache that starts one day, never goes away. So there are other headache disorders that you may potentially have, um, even if you do have hydrocephalus or not. So as I mentioned, migraine, the most common primary headache disorder, when we call a headache primary, that means it's not due to infection, it's not due to high pressure, low pressure, or there are no worrisome causes for the headache. That's why we call them primary headache disorder. Tension type headache is the most common primary headache disorder. But the problem, that tension type headache is actually not very um, disabling. So the most common type of headache, primary headache disorder, wherein you go to a doctor is still migraine. And then another common headache is cervicogenic headache wherein they have neck pain. So this is a study done by Dr. Tuli and her group, wherein they looked at 20 patients with congenital hydrocephalus with a mean age of 8.6 years of age, and 70% were found to have migraine, and only 10% had tension type headache. 20% had secondary causes for the headache. The reason why I presented this one is that although patients with hydrocephalus are at the risk of having headache, you have to consider that there are, other than worrisome causes, you potentially can have other forms of headache, which can we can treat and help you with. So for tension type headache, it's always on both sides. As I mentioned, the migraine is on one side. It's non-pounding. So if you have a headache that's on both sides and it's not pounding, and they, it doesn't get worse when you move around and you don't have nausea or vomiting, then probably you have a tension type headache. You only have to have one, either light and sound sensitivity, and those ones should be present in my in patient with migraine. Cervicogenic headache is a worrisome headache. It's a secondary type of headache wherein they have to have a neck pathology or lesion to cause the headache, and the pain is mostly on the neck area or shoulder, and sometimes it can actually reach up to this section of the uh, lower back of your head. So there are things that you can do to improve your, your or your child's headache. So um, the goals for headache treatment is of course, we need to reduce this disability. And we'll also teach you how to develop pain coping skills because these headaches could be recurrent, right? Um, because if we teach you that, we can reduce the risk of disease progression, specifically migraine, and you uh, also improve your health uh, related quality of life. And there are several things that we can do this, self-management and lifestyle intervention. This is, your, this is the part wherein you have a huge role. Okay, I'll, I'll discuss that in more detail in a bit. There is some psychological interventions like cognitive behavior therapy, relaxation therapy, or biofeedback therapy. There are some apps available. I, have, I give a lot of my patients all these apps that they can do on their own. Then those are the medication. They're divided into rescue and prevention therapy. And there's some complementary therapy, which I will mention in a bit. The nu nutritional supplements, manual therapy like massage therapy can also help. There's some evidence in using acupuncture as well. So this is the shared model of care that we use at, at Women's College Hospital, wherein there are uh, some vitamin supplements like magnesium, coenzyme Q10, vitamin B2, melatonin, and vitamin D, which have uh, were found to be helpful for migraine prevention or any other types of headaches. Screen is very important. The blue light on the screen is actually one of the triggers specifically for migraine. When And everything now is virtual, unfortunately. So I ask my patients to actually um, take a frequent breaks if they cannot do without the screen. And then I put ask them to put a, a blue light, a blue light screen to protect that because that's the blue light is the one that triggers migraine. There's a question about water intake. So I ask my patients to take anywhere from 1.5 to two liters a day uh, throughout the day because more blood flu more fluid will actually more blood that will circulate in the brain that could remove the toxins that's causing your headaches. You have to limit caffeinated drinks as I mentioned over overusing caffeine can actually trigger more migraine. 
no energy drinks and avoid sugar drinks because some of those um, flavors can, uh, uh, or artificial flavors can trigger migraine. Headache diary is very important and I will emphasize that in a bit. Um, having physical activity, avoiding triggers. So using headache diary will help you identify what your triggers are. And the most common ones, or more than one third of patients with migraine, weather changes or changes in the barometric pressure is actually a trigger for them. I do have migraine and I know when it's going to rain tomorrow. So I'm sure there's some patients there who can actually relate to me that they know when it's going to rain. There we are called weather reporters actually because we know exactly when it's going to rain. Um, and then regular sleeping and waking time. It's not just the number of sleeps that matter. It's also the regular schedule that you're following and avoiding naps, right? Um, skipping meals because low blood sugar can trigger migraines. So, and we advise them to take high protein for breakfast, anywhere from 12 to 15 grams and avoid uh, uh, more of like uh, MSG, caffeine, alcohol, cured preserved meats and aspartame, which are the common uh, food triggers for migraine. And stress management, as I mentioned, I cannot overemphasize that. This is the traffic light of headache that we actually use. Uh, this is just to describe the intensity of the pain based on how you're functioning during the headache attack. So a red headache means I have to stop. Yellow headaches, you have to slow down. And green headache, I can go. It's mild pain that you can still go wherever you want to go. So based on this, and we actually more of um, uh, give you the right treatment on a red headache. If you have, have a red headache, which medicine you take? Or if you have a yellow headache, this is the medicine that you're going to take. If it's a green, then this is the medicine you take, depending on how frequent the headaches are, okay? I mentioned to you about the importance of having a headache diary. So his mother showed Josh's headache calendar. Actually, he told me that he's only having one headache a week. It looks like he was having actually uh, eight headache days a month because um, he started with a mild headache, a green headache, and then it turns to a red. And that's when her mother, he would tell his mother and then, the tyl and then her mother uh, gives the Tylenol. That's why it lasts longer. Same thing, he's not treating early. This is the, the advantage of having this diary, just so I know, okay, I think he's having lots of headache, but the reason why he's having lots of headache is because he's not treating early. Same thing with these two patients. Both these patients have 16 headache days in a month. This patient is only having one attack in a week, but it lasts for four days. But this headache uh, patient is having two or three attacks in a week, few hours up to two days. For this patient, I might start this patient, I, I will not start a patient on um, prevention treatment, but I will give uh, this patient like a good rescue medication to see if we can knock off that green headache so it doesn't turn into red, yellow, and um, red, yellow, and green headache the next three days. So for this head patient, I might start consider prevention treatment if they would agree. So this is a picture of the brain that I showed to all my patients to explain why we need to treat early in terms of what these headaches are. And if you think that the headache is not responding to your usual medication, then that's one of the cues that you might have to worry that you're not just dealing with a primary headache or disorder like migraine. If the headache, you, you treated your headache late after 30 to 60 minutes, there's a pain switch in the brain that turns on. The problem with that is that the medicines that you used to use that were working before might be 50% less effective because you treated late and you will have a tendency to have more side effects from the medication and more side effects from the headache. And they have the tendency to go on for hours or sometimes days or sometimes weeks. Rebound headache. The reason why I added this is uh, it is called medication overuse headache or rebound headaches. Uh, it's a headache due to overusing medications for more than three months. Like for example, like Tylenol, Advil, which are over the counter. If you're using them more than 14 days in a month, you can develop rebound headaches. Triptans, more than nine days a month. 
And if you're using opioids or combination analgesic, like Tylenol number one is over the counter, for example, if you're using them more than nine days in a month, they have a tendency to um, worsen your headache because of freebound headaches. The problem of having rebound headaches due to opioids as well is that they remain refractory or they don't respond very well with any treatment. That's the reason why we educate our patients to avoid overusing um, medicines that could trigger more headaches. But there's some um, and, uh, data right now that even seven doses a month of opioids can cause rebound headaches as well. So my, my take on this is that uh, please remember to be cautious in taking medications, which increases the risk of worsening headaches. So tips and pearls, continue communicating and well, having open discussion with your healthcare provider. Regular follow-up with your doctors is very important. Keep a headache diary and make notes of your or your child's symptoms. Snoop for headache red flags, the things that I mentioned and monitor for any change in the previous headaches that you have. You're the best person to know yourself and your child. So when in doubt, ask for some advice and call your doctor. So these are my take home points, as you probably noticed um, as well that, and I hope you realize that a detailed history about your and your child's headache is crucial to help us to rule out worrisome causes for your or your child's headaches. The first and most important and the safest step to take is to snoop for headache red flags. So we have to rule out worrisome causes before we can say we're only dealing with a primary headache disorder. There are other non-worrisome but disabling headaches like migraine, which you should consider, and those should be treated and you should discuss that with your family doctor. And if you need to see a neurologist or a headache neurologist, um, then you can actually ask for that from your family doctor. Adhering to recommendations regarding lifestyle, for example, um, and can help improve your or your child's headache. Treatments for migraine and other headache disorders that I mentioned are available but you have to treat early and treatment is very early. Treatment is important to prove outcome and you may minimize side effects. Just be cautious in using medications which could trigger rebound headaches, which would make your headaches um, difficult to treat. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Lagman. That was very informative. And I, I think you answered quite a few of the questions that came in. Uh, throughout your presentation during, sorry, that came in when people registered throughout your presentation. There is one uh, question that we have. Um, I have Arnold Curie malformation, and when I get headaches lying down, makes them feel better. But although I feel better, I experience pain on the outside of my head when I'm lying down. So I don't know if this is a high pressure or a low pressure headache. So, um, so when, there, when the headache persisted, that pain around, around your head is still a headache, right? So um, obviously I need to take more history from you and all those symptoms, right? So I don't think that alone can actually help us if it's a high pressure or low pressure headache, right? Because some patients, for example, you might have a primary headache disorder like migraine, Like right? If you answer, actually answer that ID migraine tool, and then you bring that one to your family doctor and, and just say, Dr. Lyman said I might have migraine. Please, can you treat my migraines as well? So it's not just the headache and the type of headache. We also look for other symptoms associated with your headache. So we'll know if it's a worrisome headache, if it's a high pressure headache or a low pressure headache. So Arnold Carey malformation, there are different types of them as well. So I don't know which type you have, so the carry one is the one that 5% of us will have. So in those ones, 5% um, of us in the general population will have it. It doesn't mean that you need treatment for that, right? So I don't know exactly what type of heart node carry, but the type two, three, and four, those are the ones with hydrocephalus. And if you have a shunt, then of course, for sure, we might have to dig in further and snoop for red flags for you. So we'll know if it's a high or low pressure headache. Thank you. Um, another question. Well, actually, it's a statement with a question in it. Mm -hmm. So, hello, thank you for this very interesting webinar. Could you please address the same subject concerning adult ETV patients suffering from all forms of undetermined headaches? 
Okay, so um, it, it so the 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 only the one thing that I can answer is that for us, you are definitely at risk of this different types of worrisome headaches and also primary headache disorders, right? So if your doctors tell you that your ETV is functioning or, or they measured your pressure and it's normal, then your family doctors should look for a primary headache disorder. You may potentially have migraine. That is probably the reason why you're having persistent headaches, right? I don't believe that the headaches are undetermined. I, I'm quite biased because I'm a headache medicine specialist. So, and I always tell this to my patient, there's no such thing as normal headaches. There's no such thing. I want to dig in further and take your history. So we'll know if it's a tension tag headache, a, mi a migraine headache, or it's a cluster headache, because there are some available treatments for that, that could make and improve your, your quality of life and not having a headaches. I feel my heart is breaking if I hear a patient that they're having a headaches and nobody's actually listening to them and describing them. So I think this one, I'm hoping, um, and Shauna, thank you for inviting me. It's more of to clarify, and maybe sometimes you can actually just go to your doctor and say, I attended this webinar. These are the things that Dr. Lagman mentioned that I could have a migraine. Can you actually treat me, right? Or sometimes you really have to advocate for, your, for yourself. Or refer me to someone who can possibly help yeah. me. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. And where would someone find a list of uh, doctors who specialize in headaches like you do? So Migraine Canada web website, they do have that. So um, the academic centers with a headache in Ontario is us, Women's College Hospital. Okay. We actually teach a lot of the family doctors to treat my migraine and other types of headaches. Trust me, it's not part of our, it's a, a struggle, right? So we are trying our best and there's only a handful of us. That's why we have a two year wait list, majority of us, right? So I think we can't handle every, every single patient with, my, with headache or migraine. You know how frequent migraine is from, from this presentation, right? That's the reason why we actually um, ask our patients or, or the family doctor to actually attend our teaching sessions to so they can learn how to um, uh, treat migraine or that's, any other types of headaches. That's amazing that you're doing that with the family doctors. Um, we do. We have a project going on and we do um, have a lot of education sessions with them. Uh, we do um, start with family medicine residents, right? So we take them in our clinic and that's how we teach them. One, they're still in, in training. I think it's better. That's a better approach as compared to it's and our center is the first one in Canada we're in we actually involve them in our headache clinics all the wonderful. rest of them. yeah wonderful we've got quite a few more questions here so uh, let's see if we can try and get through them um, would ventricle slit syndrome be a low pressure headache thank you yes. answered yes yeah, it could be um, I think that's the first thing that you will probably think of that you're it's because of over drainage right so it's more of low pressure but the problem is they found as, a, as I mentioned a while ago that it could be a high pressure as well right so I think that's what the importance of your neurosurgeon being actively involved in your care if you have slip ventricle syndrome okay um, the next question uh, I have a three-year-old child who complains of headaches, but had an ETV. Would the red flags be the same? Um, yes, it could still be the same. The problem is because she, uh, your child is three years old, then there's no, um, uh, I think I gave you some clues, right? On what to look for, like hitting the head. Uh, so it's still basically the same. If there's any uh, signs of infection, signs of like intractable vomit. A child will not uh, will not vomit unless there's some problem, right? So if um, and if uh, there is some unsteady gait, like she, the, your child is already three, by this time he can he can already hop by this time, right? So if he's not able to do that and he's not he's not himself, they're the best one to know your child. So if he's not playing, then worry about that. 
Right. And they're I think more you... unfair, they're more inferred in the behavior because he won't be able to verbal, verbalize, right? Verbalize. And that's where your job is. It's more of like looking for those clues. Okay. And I think you probably answered this next question. Um, do children vomit because of pain? No, they don't vomit because of pain. They vomit because, for example, if a patient with migraine, it's part of the migraine syndrome. Okay. Right? So it's not because of their pain, that's why they're vomiting. It's more of the mechanism of migraine. Remember that pain switch I mentioned? That's the center of vomiting. So if the pain went in that center of uh, the brain, then the patient will vomit. But if a child has a shunted hydrocephalus and says they have a headache and is vomiting, would that be a red flag? Yes, for sure. Yeah, especially if it's not it's nonstop and it's progressively getting worse. So the right word is progressive or a sudden change. Like she was vomiting for some other reasons and now it can it doesn't stop. It kept on, you know, going on and on and on, right? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh -huh. uh, the next question, our son's hydrocephalus was treated using ETV. Should we expect him to experience headaches, even if there is a normal CSF flow? So, um, the, so if, you're, if the ETV is working and there's no, and the pressure is normal, then you should not expect any headache. Although having said that, even patients with or without hydrocephalus are at risk of having um, other uh, primary headache disorder. So if there is a family history of migraine in your family or other types of headaches, the likelihood of your child having headache will be, will be high. 50 to 75% of patients with migraine will have a first degree relative, majority of the time, the female side of the family with migraine. So if you do have that, then your child will have a tendency to develop other types of headache, which the more common one will be tension type headache and migraine. This question is from Natalie, and she's asking, is it better to have a neurosurgeon look into your symptoms or a neurologist? So both, whoever you can access, because the neurologist can call a neurosurgeon and your neurosurgeon can call a neurologist. Like usually they work hand in hand, right? So, and I think if the, it's a surgical, the, the good thing about the neurologist is that they will ask more questions as compared to a neurosurgeon. If you, um, the neurosurgeon will just look at your shunt, but we, as neurologists, we ask more. We're, we actually, we snoop for red flags, snoop for other things and look for other things that could uh, potentially. So I think the first step will be either, which is number one, whichever is accessible to you. And number, because if the, it's not a problem for the neurosurgeon, then they will actually contact your neurologist, right? But if it's your neurologist as well, if you need neurosurgical intervention, then they will contact your neuro, neuro, neurosurgeon. Okay. Um, this next question is from uh, an individual who's 68 years old, and she says she has enlarged ventricles, but has not been seen um, at a shunt clinic yet. Um, her headaches appear to be red flag type headaches. Should she go to emerge? So obviously, if your worry symptom is like from one to 10 is 10, then I would say yes, right? So, and if it's progressively getting worse, then I would say if your primary doctor can't help you, I th the only thing is that because of COVID and all these infections around us, you have to be very careful. But if your worry symptoms are really bad, like more of like, your top is like 10, then go. I think you're the best person to actually more of gauge if that's something like oh, you have to go to the emergency room or is it something, oh yeah, I can wait for my family doctor to see me, right? Okay, and now we have a, a, a question from one of our French attendees. So uh, I think Margot is going to ask this question. I will now ask the question in French. So. Which are the signs of a, a, a malfunctioning of the uh, drain? I have a DVP, a deriv derivation uh, of the ventricle. I am 43 years old. So what are the signs of a malfunctioning of the, of the shunt? So 
meaning like symptoms or more like symptoms are more of what you're experiencing right and signs will be what you see uh right so i think for the symptoms more of like a progressive headache right uh, number two more of like the vomiting as i mentioned a while ago right and all those like um sometimes you can have personality changes or unsteady gait that you're sleepy um uh you have you can have like doubling of your vision or um you can have uh urinary incontinence meaning voiding frequently or accidents right because you can control your your bladder if your feet stick and you have light sensitivity is that a low or high pressure headache is it a red flag so if you're can you say that again if your feet are sticking, I'm guessing she means when you're walking and your feet are kind of stuck to the floor um, mm -hmm. and you have hydrocephalus and you have also light sensitivity, is that a low or high pressure headache? I These are some of the symptoms I think that she's yeah. describing. With just those two, I don't think I can answer if it's a low or high pressure headache. So I think that question is actually very uh, hard to answer mainly because I will need more information, number one, and I have to examine you as well, just to make sure, and then do a neurologic examination just to make sure. I want to look at the back of your eyes. If there's no, just one symptom or two symptoms may not be enough for us to know if it's a high or low pressure. It has to be with more, like the other symptoms as well. And again, the type of headaches that you're having. So uh, I, unfortunately, I'm so sorry. I will need more information uh, before I can answer that question. Okay. We will um, revisit that one <laughs> off air, offline. One last question. Uh, for slit ventricle syndrome, do you have to have all five distinct syndromes or just one? So um, those are the, the five distinct syndromes will be for different patients. So one might have like, oh, it's a high pressure. It, the, the patient has slit ventricle syndrome because of a high pressure, or it could be a low pressure. The five syndromes is more of possible explanations why a patient will have slit ventricle syndrome. They don't have to have all of them. They may only have one. Okay. Or Thank you. they could have like a combination of like a high pressure plus a primary headache disorder like migraine. So that's more complicating the story, but- Okay. Right? But- you don't have to have like high pressure and low pressure, right? So both, it should be just one. Although having said that, I had patients were in, they had intermittent low pressure and high pressure. That's why uh, her, the neurosurgeons of the patient and us were like scratching our heads. We don't know what to do. So yeah, those patients will need like prolonged ICP monitoring and that's why they get admitted. Yes, I'm sure there, there are some cases that are very hard to diagnose. Um, exactly, exactly. It's not like an EC high or low. Yeah. Um, one more question popped in. Um, is there a reason migraines are more common in women? So um, interesting question. So the other, the easy answer to that is we don't know, but we have some, so we have some theories about it because of the hormonal, the effect of hormone in migraine. So in, it's not that pro, in males, if they, had, they have earlier onset of their migraines between seven to 10 years of age, and by their teens and late twenties, majority of the headaches are gone. So the fathers, they don't even remember that they had migraine, right? So however, though, in ma females, they get worse over time. So cumulatively, that's why they have more females as well, or women with migraine. The other more important one is the effect of estrogen or a hormone that you have in women that is triggering more headaches. Okay. I or think we will- migraine attack. Okay, great. This has been such a wonderful presentation and lots of good questions from our audience that you've been able to answer. We would like to thank you very much for joining us today. And we're gonna close off today with a thank you to Dr. Lagman for her time. And um, please watch for new sessions coming more in the fall and into the new year. Thank you again, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you.